We are live. So welcome to our latest soul session as I mute the other computer. Um, I'm not going to talk a whole lot because I want to get out of the way of these two fine people um, so that they can proceed to this conversation. What we want you to know is we have been doing these soul sessions since 2017. This was a brainchild between a member of our center, Donald John Lewis, and our founding minister, Reverend Jesse Jennings, the gentleman up there in the purple shirt. And tonight we are pleased, thrilled over the moon to welcome Tracy Brown, uh, Dr. Tracy Brown. Uh, let me give you a short bio. Uh, she is a practitioner with the Centers for Spiritual Living. She has been a student of New Thought Ancient Wisdom since 1986. She is the author of more than a dozen books. Most recently, Stained Glass Spirit, which I highly recommend, by the way, Be becoming a spiritual community where oneness does not require sameness. She is the past chair of the Leadership Council, which is the governing body of C Centers for Spiritual Living. And she is the recipient of two of CSL's highest honors, the Ernest Holmes Award, which I've heard she is the only non-minister to have been granted that award. And she is an honorary doctorate of humane letters, which I got to go to that ceremony. That was fantastic. And while a majority of her work includes all dimensions of diversity and building a practical strategy for inclusion, she is also well known for her contributions to the initiative focused on race, racism, and race relations. So I'm going to get off this screen and let these two wonderful people go at it. And it's gonna be amazing and good and wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you, Reverend Lisa Ryan. <clears throat> well, Tracy and uh, Tracy and I agreed beforehand, no titles. So she's Tracy and I'm Jesse. And we're, we're, we are over the moon to have, we just gushed about this in the, in the uh, prep time we had on, on zoom before we went live here, we gushed about having you. It is awesome to have you with us. And I just want to thank you for two things in particular. I want to thank you for what you've done for CSL and new thought altogether in your amazing work around healing the divisions and taking stock of where we are in the world and moving forward in a healthier way together as one human family recognizing our diversity and honoring our diversity. I wanna thank you also personally. You may, you may not know this or remember this, but when Hurricane Harvey hit our area, you were one of the first two people to reach out to me to ask how we were doing. And uh, you, you wrote me a long email and, and you, wanted, you wanted detailed information. And I gave you detailed information about exactly where we were at the time. You and Dr. Ken Gordon were the two that I will forever, and I've told him this, that forever remain in my heart because of your, your great care. And uh, yeah, so... Thank you. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm delighted to be with you too, because um, all of that's really beautiful words. But in my mind, I'm like, oh my goodness, I get to spend an hour with the legendary Jesse Jennings. What have I done so well that I get this opportunity? Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, Thank right. You. Thank so we've got this mutual fan club going on because I think what I see is that both of us are really committed to applying what we teach to life in the real world. And so, you know, this human experience is not is not horrible. It's an opportunity to practice what we teach and to apply it. And uh, I've you know, seen you do that through your writing and through the way that you lead in your own community. And um, in some ways, even before I knew you, like we were very much in alignment in that regard. 
thank you very much. And it, that, that means a great deal. Let me start with this, and, and we, this is, a, as, I, as we discussed, this is a conversation. It's not, it's not an interview. I'm not going to fire questions at you, but we'll, we'll just talk. We'll just talk. And I've got several things that are, I have a couple of pet peeves I want to bring up and see what you feel about them. And, and then I'll start with this, which is that when I came into Science of Mind, the policy at the time was that churches as we call them then didn't advertise you just took whoever showed up and you did what you did you sent we had a we had a red book called the science of mind hymnal you may have seen it and it, and it was old protestant hymns with with kind of more upbeat words put to them <laughs> and the whole service looked meaning no disrespect it looked vaguely presbyterian Everyone sat in straight rows. The minister, male or female, wore dress clothes uh, and so on. And the idea was that whoever showed up had been brought there by spirit and they were, they were ready for this. Now, over the decades, time, times have changed and we're looking now, it's a, it's a much different environment. And as we're in Zoom and we're working to worldwide audiences, there's sometimes a sense of competition, like at 11 o'clock on a Sunday morning central time, you could watch anyone you want. And so my community, your community, every community has to pull people in and give them something useful. In your book, you talk about targeting audiences of marginalized people, particularly to show them the relevance of this teaching to them. Let's talk about that. I love that. Um, and when I'm talking about targeting audiences, sometimes um, I, I, you know, sometimes marginalized as it is commonly used is where I'm focused. And other times we have to really be careful about how we define marginalized. So if we look at marginalized in the context of not previously included, not previously invited, welcomed, and not previously integrated in, that may be by race or ethnicity, but I'm also really aware a lot of, of our New Thought spiritual communities are in areas where there is not a lot of racial or ethnic diversity. So we also have to know that if we use that term or any term that we choose, that we're talking about targeting people who are available and you know in your geographic area, they're people who you have not engaged with before. So that might be by sexual orientation, that might be by different religious background in everywhere in North America, at least, there is the challenge with age. So, right, what are you doing to reach, to attract, to be meaningful to people from different age groups or who speak different languages. And race may not be the issue, but you may have immigrants from different parts of Europe who are in your community. So I believe, I, I agree, it's a pet peeve for me when I hear leaders say things like, you know, whoever shows up is meant to be here. We just hold the space and, and the right, you know, like spirit will sprinkle the right people into our pot. No, yeah. yes and no, but no, are you here to serve and teach and expand the reach of science of mind or not? And if you are, and if you really believe that this teaching has the ability to influence and to improve the lives of thousands or millions of people, then you need to go out, find those people and learn how to relate to them so they can see the power of this teaching as well. Thank you. Yes. And the, what is it, 40% now unchurched? Uh, that, yeah, that number is climbing. And yeah. the younger the age group, the higher the percentage. The higher the number. Yeah. 
sometimes for us it's not been a fit for people and this is this is kind of strange it's like we're a welcoming community and somebody will come in because we're a welcoming community but we do not teach that jesus christ is your lord and savior and they want that they want a welcoming community that teaches them the traditional values that they grew up with and and we can't we can't pivot our message and wouldn't you know to because that's pandering right and we're not talking about pandering we're talking about helping people identify how universal spiritual principles allows them to live a life they love and so it it is a there is a dance going on right with we have some leaders in some communities in all of new thought who are saying oh well to reach the unchurched, we have to get rid of all language that sounds like God or worship or, or Jesus or get rid of all of that and go to these, you know, philosophical terms. And, and then you have other people saying, no, the way to, to build a bridge is to quote the Bible more and to write, alter the way that you, the language you use in prayer. And as you and I both know, the answer is never in one extreme or the other, right? right? So if you are are seeking to attract Black people who pretty much come from, uh, you know, in general, come from the traditional Christian uh, experience, if you're trying to attract people who have come out of Catholicism, and, and loved the ritual and the beauty of Catholicism and are very much into more formality, then in your community, you have to find the balance that allows you to get people to go beneath the surface of dogma and stayed ritual. And see, here's the principle now, how can we best apply that principle or demonstrate that principle or teach that principle or model that principle without making people wrong? That's the big mistake we make. We make people wrong. If they wanna pray and say in the name of Jesus, I'm gonna educate them why we don't say that, but I'm not gonna make them wrong for continuing a tradition that means something to them as we dance with each other, right? I will be clear, I mean, that may not have a place in a five-step spiritual mind treatment. And here are some other language that, that represents the wholeness, but I'm not gonna say to them, oh, you can't say that here because that's too Christian. Yeah, yeah. We were talking about this in class, just this thing on prayer, you know, the treatment's not the only form of prayer any of us use, but it's the one we teach from the stage. And the reason we teach it from the stage is because most people haven't heard it before. That's our, that's our stock and trade is teaching spiritual mind treatment, but we're not taking away the Lord's prayer or the Dayenu or Namu Myoho Renge Kyo or anyone else's practice. And the, the matter of God, too, I know I get, you know, it's, it's a conundrum because you'll talk about God in such a way as that someone says, well, that's not the God of my upbringing. When you talk about it being all there is and no sin and no judgment, and they've been laboring under the sense of sin and judgment. So you're redefining God for them, and it makes them uncomfortable, maybe. And so then you start talking about the ultimate ground of all being, or one of those philosophical abstractions you mentioned. And after a while, they're saying, well, where's God in all this? And sometimes it's like, well, you can't win. But you, do, you are winning because we're chipping away at it. And this is uh, it's something I think about all the time is that we mess people up for true embedded negativity. Anyone who sits through any of our talks at any of our centers, any of our classes, any of our workshops goes out of there with a sense of, I could be more than I seem to be. And that, that haunts them. It's like they used to say, or maybe still do, if, the, the, if you go to an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting, the least thing it will do is ruin your drinking. 
you know, because forever after you'll wonder, well, then why was I there? So yeah. why did I hear this? Why did I hear this? Yeah. Um, yeah. I know that we have an outreach in some of our centers to the homeless, particularly urban centers. And I know that we have a, a larger outreach to the incarcerated. Uh, through our home office. What has bothered me for a very long time is the new thought prosperity message as it relates to the working poor uh, of, of any ethnicity. But I read material that says to be prosperous, you need to save money. You need to set money aside to play. You need to, of course, tithe to your spiritual center. And I read articles of inspiration that are talking about you could have a new kitchen in your lake home. And many of the people around me in my community and in my center want a new set of tires on the car they drive to their three jobs every day. Come on, just, and, just, and, and, just you know, bring the truth. And, and, they're, and they're, one, they're one toothache away from financial ruin. Yeah, it is a misnomer. And it is, it's one of the places where so in the last few years, the phrase unconscious bias or implicit bias has gained more awareness and more popularity. And that is one of the places in the examples that are often used in the standard that is subtly set by default being based on what, you know, what my own experience has been and having ministers or teachers or leaders who, you know, their ministry may be their second or third career or their independent lead. And I'm, I'm careful about using the word wealthy, but financially stable or have a spouse that is providing some financial stability and it's not coming from the ministry, but those life experiences are not universal. One of the things I say to the students, the ministerial students in the class that I get to teach for our School of Spiritual Leadership within Centers for Spiritual Living, I, one of the things I bring up very early is that your experience is not universal, but your responsibility is to meet people where they are, not make them work to try to understand the world from where you are as the speaker or as the teacher. And it's really tricky because we, who we are does inform what we know and how we can tell the story. But it can be as simple as, you know, I outlined the talk that I'm going to give. And I think of the three examples I'm going to use for the three points I want to make. Then I go back and say, what is the real point of this story? Now, what's an example that I can find from a different cultural group? or a different age group, or from someone who has a different background than mine. If all of my examples are from the world of uh, professional sports, because I love professional sports, I'm going to lose a whole lot of people, regardless of gender and regardless of age, because they've been exposed to different athletes or different teams or the teams that were the teams when I was growing up, half of them have moved to different cities, <laughs> right? Yeah. So, so I cannot build my message or my teaching based on my experience thinking it's universal. And when we remember that, then we find ourselves telling the stories differently 
or providing different assignments, different interactive uh, exercises or activities. Because in fact, one of the things I used to do, I don't do it as much now, but I used to challenge myself to integrate something that was so different from my background, you know, that I was a little uncomfortable. Because then it's like, I will reach someone for whom this story, this example will really resonate with them. One, and then two, another really practical tip is if you commit to do this, it forces you to expand your personal network. So when I wanted to tell a story about that had some connection to people who speak Spanish and maybe grew up in a different socioeconomic uh, condition than I did, I had to go find a couple of people who had that life experience and ask them, does this sound right? Is this credible? Will this make sense? Tell me your story. Ooh, that's good. Yeah. Can I use that story without using your name? Can I you know, make it a little more generic? Because now I know it is a lived experience. And, and who had come to these people before and said to them, tell me your story? I mean, what a gift that is. Right. And tell me your story, not so I can steal it. Tell me your story so I can understand another way of life. One of the things that I say probably way too much, and thank you, Karen Drucker, for the song, You Are the Face of God. Because for me, the whole thing about diversity is that the more diversity I have authentic interaction with, the more faces of God I am not just seeing, but I am knowing and understanding and engaging with. And that expands me. But if I just am constantly surrounding myself with people who have a similar experience, then I'm seeing my face, I'm seeing my experience, but how much of, of God am I missing? Jack. I don't Jack. wanna miss God. I'm only in this body, in this physical form on this earth for a minute, even if it's a hundred years, like, you know, for a short time. I want to engage with and learn from and see as many ways as that God can show up in the world as I can. And, and when we say we want this teaching to reach the world, that means we have to, we, we are compelled to experience how different people live and what different people need and take the teaching to them. How does everybody not want that? I don't understand. You know, and I'm not being glib or judgmental, but how do you not want to interact with people who have a different frame of reference than your own? And, and be in the yeah. people want to be comfortable. Yeah. I mean, you mentioned in your yeah, you mentioned being liked. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. The human part of us wants to be comfortable. The human part of us wants to be safe. The human part of us has a has has been affected by collective consciousness that says you should stay with your own kind that what is different is dangerous. But we know that we are, we have a spiritual consciousness and that we have spiritual principle that, that guides us to explore 
spirit in all of its ways. And why should we be afraid of that, of people who are different, of a different way of worshiping, of a different way to talk about spirit, of a different way to apply it in the world? We can't be afraid of that. But we have to help people. I don't want to use the word balance. So what is the word that wants to come forward? Oh, my theme for the year, of course. We have to integrate the divinity and the humanity in ourselves and as leaders, as spiritual leaders, not just by the title, but any individual who says, I want to be a leader in the world and in terms of spirituality. As leaders, our job is to guide others in being able to integrate their divinity and their spirit, their divinity and their humanity, because that's what we do. We're navigating a human experience being guided by spiritual principle. Yeah. You touched on earlier our oneness and our uniqueness and you do in your book stained glass spirit um to me it seems like our oneness there's nothing we need to do about that it's been it's pre-existent it's not our creation we are we are one uh we always have and by we i mean all life everywhere not not even just in the in this solar system but our uniqueness that's where we have everything to do Everything. To explore, explore our own path and find our own way and and come back with the information that we have and share it with the group. Yeah, and Ernest Holmes has, there's several Ernest Holmes quotes where he talks about unity and multiplicity. And it may, I remember a few years ago, I don't remember which one of the quotes it was, but I read it and I stopped and I journaled and I thought, and I was like, you know, it's true. There is no unity when everybody is the same. I mean, that's, that's the sameness, but the, it's, it's not unity, it's, it's uniformity and it's comfort. You can't have unity unless you have things that are different coming together and yeah, intentionally like intentionally choosing to move forward together to whatever the common goal is that's unity and so you know when ernest Holmes talks about multiplicity does not you know does not over arch unity you've got to have that or emerson talks about how the you know multiplicity comes from the unity and the unity comes from the multiplicity and so this is not new stuff <laughs> right it's not new stuff it's just are we willing to look at it are we willing to accept it and are we willing to allow it to guide how we engage with people who are different from ourselves in our spiritual community and in the community where we live. And then of course, in the world. And it takes work. And most, of, most people unfortunately want to believe the lie that, oh, but if I'm spiritual, it's, not, it's just automatic. It just happens. I don't have to work. Yeah, you have to do something. Yeah. <laughs> and it's and it's intrinsic to the work. You know, it's not an elective. It's not an add-on that you're a spiritual being and oh, by the way, you're doing diversity work or you're doing inclusion work. It's it's part of the same thing. If you're gonna you you write in your book about walking your talk, you've got to you've got to do this, which in my life has looked at looked like confronting my own privilege, my own white privilege. And I'm not just, I mean, uh, not to get into my whole story, although I did a lot on Sundays, it turns out, but I'm not just privileged because I'm white, I'm privileged because I was raised in privilege. I was raised in privilege even among white people, especially academic privilege. 
and to look at how the white people have built the halls of power on at least four continents on this planet and have from time to time grudgingly granted admission to everyone else makes me sick and and makes me um, desperate to see change and of course whenever i bring that up a bunch of white people leave the room yes Yes, because it is still not typical to hear someone who appears or is or identifies as white to say the playing field is not level, has never been level, and if we don't change, it won't be level. But we have to be the ones as people who are white to make the change because everybody else, if, if we're talking about, especially from the context of racism, everyone else who is not white has already stood up, has already made it clear, uh, you know, this has to change. And that the only way it will change is when the people who created the system deconstruct the system that they benefit from disproportionately. There's nothing I can do. I mean, I can, I can operate within the system. I can navigate within the system, but I don't have the power to change the system as someone who has been really not in the design to benefit from the system. Right. So when and, we have enough yeah. white folks who say this has to stop and here's what I'm willing to do to contribute to the change, that's when it will change. You know, I, this sounds really clinical, but there's the cost benefit aspect to this. Yeah. You, you as an African-American woman asking for society to change are seen as someone who would benefit from that change. I being who I am asking for it to change is seen as someone who would pay a cost. Cost I'm willing to pay and cost a lot of other white people I know willing to pay and uh, are saying it, but finding the words because it's a relatively new concept for us to confront this. As you write about so beautifully in your book and so many others write on these subjects, we have been saying to ourselves, we white people that I'm speaking of, been saying to ourselves for a very long time, well, I'm not racist, I love everybody, and so forth and so on, without looking at being the beneficiary of a system that is racist, and, and, and has been for 400 years, at least. Um, so to, to look at that and say, what, what must I give up, or what must I do differently, is is always the question and a great many teachers like yourself say you know the white people must do the work and we're willing to do the work help us know what that work looks like yeah so you know there's work on three levels there's the work on the individual level and that i do see more people than ever before in the you know time that i've been alive and the time i've researched before i was alive that um you know, there are more, more and more people who are white, who are very clear on an individual level, they are willing to take action. And on from the individual level, you go to the interactive level, and that percentage is also growing when you think about interaction as an individual with others or with small groups. The untackled territory is the institutional level. The institutional level requires right many individuals to come together to change the system. Now we have seen this work in many ways. Um, we have recently even seen it work um, to hold on to the system of racism and the systems of oppression that many individuals then become groups and those groups become larger and powerful and will do just about anything 
that is humanly imaginable in order to hold on to the oppression and to the systems. The question for me that I am often asking is, why, why is it that people, quote unquote, of good faith, won't will refuse why is it that we will refuse to have that same intensity and that same commitment to say no no matter what it takes racism must stop no no matter what it takes homophobia must stop no no matter what it takes and that takes me not just being an individual, but that means I have to be involved in group activity and it has to be structured and organized. And I'm going to bat for this. I'm committing my life or my money or my time to shift collective consciousness and collective power dynamics. And uh, this sounds a little harsh, but I don't think it's inaccurate. In New Thought, we've been hiding behind this false belief that there are two, there are three. Well, false belief number one, all I have to do is pray because I am praying and the mental thought that is the basis for the change I am I am planting that seed in the soil and God will do the rest, number one. Number two, I'm spiritual. And that means I'm quiet and calm and solemn. I don't want to be angry. No, I want to have some righteous anger about demanding the world I live in to represent the world that spirit created. And number three, that fear of loss that you mentioned. I've been, if I am someone who has benefited from the system the way it is, even though I didn't put it into place, I don't know what it would like be like if I risked that. So we don't, we don't, we don't, we have a fear of losing what's been comfortable. And I think that's on our leaders. We have not done a good job of describing and getting a clear vision of what success looks like. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're so focused on, oh, I did this in a, um, in the What Is Mine to Do group, uh, every, about once a quarter, I do a, a series called a challenge, a five day challenge called Break the Silence. I break the silence of talking about racism. And there is a day in the five days where I ask people to really consider, you know, you are so passionate about we must end racism. All right. Let's say that's a prayer. Racism ends. What does the world look like? Yes. When no racism. Yes, exactly. And almost always, like 95% of the time, people have no way to describe it. Well, it wouldn't be this and people wouldn't do this. You're still focused on what's broken. I want you to be able to talk to me and to everybody you meet about how the world works, what it looks like, how great it is, what's the benefit to you when there's no racism. Yeah, yeah. Vision pulls. We don't have a vision. We have a feeling that it would be better because we decided this that we have is bad. I don't want racism anymore. Okay, great. None of us do. It's bad. We don't like it. But we don't know what it looks like, how we behave, what it feels like, how the world would be operating, how it changes our church services, what we would be teaching in classes. We can't, we don't have a concrete 
image that we're moving toward, we're so busy fighting against something. That is beautifully put, beautifully put. And it's something that you as a practitioner, I'm sure have seen with a number of clients just on their personal issues. Well, how would you feel? How would your life look at this problem or here? Well, I have no idea because it's been here so long. I've never thought about it. Well, maybe well, I've thought, thought about it a lot, but I can't even imagine it. Can't I don't even have any imagine. Yeah. words for it. And if you move the emotional energy onto the reality that you prefer to occupy, as you say, vision draws and it pulls it toward that. So what is a multi-ethnic society in love with itself and a multi-sexuality uh, society in love with itself look like and feel like? And would that be all right with us? And, and would, it, would we maintain the uniqueness that we have? I know an African-American man here in town who wrote an interesting piece in the paper a few years ago where he said that he missed segregation because in segregation he had a neighborhood and he and he had his people and he could walk down his streets and not be not have to deal with the horrors of interacting with racist white people and and it made me stop and think and I was reading how in uh, in Houston there the last lesbian bar closed recently because everybody is nominally welcome everywhere and so you can go but something was lost there and so how would we create as a society enclaves where we could go and be among the people that we identify with not just racially or ethnically but by by affinity you know affinity groups remember the silmar they used to do this they had a uh, oh, if you're interested in, I don't know, violin music or something, you put an index card on the on the uh, on the bulletin board and that group will meet at such and such a time in in this building and everybody. So they spent their day, everybody looking for their affinity group where they joined and then came back together for the meal, you know, and that you can have affinity groups and that's not considered divisive. Yeah. Like let's let's share what we share together, but that doesn't separate us from, or there's not a judgment about it that this group is bad or this group is, you know, okay. And so, yeah, I mean, that's the challenge, but in a truly inclusive environment, right? Unity does not require uniformity. And in fact, you cannot even get to unity unless all of the different, the ways we're different from one another are affirmed and nurtured. And when we come together, we can actually celebrate that interest or that difference. I, 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 I would so love to see us go by leaps and bounds and in society as a whole and specifically within centers for spiritual living if we if if we can do it then we become a model for the macrocosm we we should be able to do it based on and not not from a place of arrogance i don't believe that our teaching in a CSL or in science of mind or in any new thought. I don't think it's the best and the only way. I really don't. Yeah. But I do know that if we were living our principles, we would be modeling a very different world and way of being. Agreed, agreed. Normativity comes to mind. And uh, you know, I just mentioned like violin music. Well, a bunch of us had a conversation a while back. Said that classical music, for example, was created almost entirely by white people on the European continent over a certain window of time. And then it's been added to, the canon's been added to since, but there's a body of work, you know, that you're Beethoven and you're Bach. And all. This is considered the highest form of music on the planet. By whom? It's the music that 
most all of us were, you know, this is serious music. Popular music is a step down from that. You know, there's this whole hierarchy. And then you take it into the world of art. You take it into the world of literature. You take it into, and I know that you as a black woman have probably been styled as a black author and not an author. And so there's a certain market share that's pegged to that. And the idea of white heteronormativity is, is really bothersome to me because I didn't get a vote in this. <laughs> but I'm looked at like I did. You know what I'm saying? And, and it's not even about perception. It's not, it's not about that at all. It's about the, um, you, you mentioned Ubuntu in, in, your, in your book, the, the greeting. Uh, why did I not hear that mm -hmm. long before? Why, why, why am I not familiar with the griot? Why, why was this not part of my early uh, influence? Actually, I went to a school founded by a biracial nun from Harlem, so more showed up than might have otherwise for me personally in, in the first nine years of my schooling, but who decided what's normal? Yeah. And it is always true that, you know, whoever, whomever is in power determines what is normal. So within Centers for Spiritual Living, we have an opportunity to define what is normal, that we live in a different way, um, that we began to include in history courses, a broader example of people who contributed to the growth and the teaching and the practice of science of mind, that when we include people who were four, four founders uh, and provided inspiration, um, if we're treat, teaching Emerson, that we don't miss the opportunity to teach the fact that he did a lot of talks and wrote a lot about anti-slavery and mm -hmm. abolitionism. And how can we teach about Emerson applying the principles that he taught that we love so much that inspired us and not say, and this is how he demonstrated that he believed this. Yeah. In the mid 1800s, he spoke up and said this slavery was not in alignment with this principle of everyone being created by the same uh, creator and created equally. But I, I mean, you know, I didn't hear that in any of the classes that I took. So we, we can break the mold. And if we break the mold, within our own movement, then people see it and go, oh, and then they begin to look in their other parts of their lives. Where else did I not know? Where else did I, was I not taught that this person of color made this contribution? Where else was I never exposed to the fact that people like me created a system that benefited them and put others down and it just seems normal. So we, you know, we can change the whole world and that's a pretty daunting task. So I can change me and I can change I can create change with the people I come into contact with. And if we're all doing that, 250,000 people within um, Science of Mind and Centers for Spiritual Living, think about all the people we touch. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. A couple of things for you. I want to thank you for, Lisa, I got I to gotta say what I got to <laughs> We're <laughs> I want to thank you for the excellent video series that CSL Dallas, I think under your leadership created on black history and new thought, which I've been using as a reference and I'm, I'm going to put online uh, 
in a way directly for the historical foundations and new thought classes that I teach for the School of Spiritual Leadership. I brought up people I knew like Dr. Dan and, and uh, I, I did meet Dr. Homer Johnson briefly back in, in the 70s. Uh, but you bring up Emerson. I was not, I, I recall like you, that there was no biographical background on him given when he was first taught to us. We were handed four essays as if they dropped out of the sky. <laughs> but I also remember that they didn't tell us that Troward was a white supremacist and, and advocated for that passionately in the last chapter of the Doré lectures. And that's something I think should be brought to light as well, not just who our heroes were, but who the people were whose work we revere that we have to separate their their personal or we have to from. see them in the light of who they were in their times and not it's again it's not a hundred or zero it's like oh wow that seems like a conflict that's really interesting what was going on in his life and Oh, he was part of the colonization in India because he was, right? And that was his job and that's how he was raised. And I'm not going to hate him for that. And it does not take away from the truth of his writing. It just makes him a whole human being. And uh, it means that I can see all of who he is. He's not a one-dimensional person because none of us are either and so I've got to be able or I would like it if we were all able to recognize that we're talking about a human being and no I wish you know there was something different I could say but I can see this and it doesn't negate the brilliance of the Edinburgh lectures yeah they're brilliant, no question. The conversation that Danielle and Lisa and I particularly, and David also had about this, is that we tee people up because they've never heard of Troy, you see. It'd be different if, if we were talking about, oh, I don't know, Harper Lee or someone, you know, and, they can, and they'd read all of this. And, and, and now we're reinterpreting and we're saying, oh, well, she had certain blind spots in the, you know, the context of her times. But we hand them Troy and say, this is, this is magical spiritual work until they get to that chapter and they look at us in horror and they say, is this, is this part of what we teach? So yeah, it's uh, Lisa, I think has something, I had a million more things I wanted to bring up with you um, about appropriation and uh, versus um, uh, standing in solidarity. And, well, let's, and see, let's see what Lisa let's see what she has, has, and then we'll, we may go there or a couple of other places. All right. Well, part of the reason why I clicked in when I did, because we were willing to let you keep talking, is that you were talking about education, and we had somebody make a comment that that is one of the things that we need to include more of. Uh, her comment was that she, okay, it starts with, CSL could integrate anti-racism class into the core curriculum. Mm -hmm. And then she gave some examples of classes that she's taken. And we do for ministers, because I'm a product of your class uh, and, and you know loved every minute of being in that class. And so, you know, why are we, why is it not, why do we not have a um, social change, including anti-racism work, pro-diversity, equality, uh, no, excuse me, equity and inclusion. Why isn't that part of our core curriculum? So, so neither one of us have the authority to speak on behalf of Centers for Spiritual Living. Neither one of us are in any role. I think that is a question that can be uh, continuously brought up. Having said that, and having been on the leadership council for six years, not too long ago, I can say that the class for ministers, right? It took about six years for it to be 
for it to happen and then to become mandatory. And it has been mandatory since 2014, which is not really all that long. And the staff at CSL has been working on incorporating not anti-racism so much as pro-inclusion content into the change. So I do know that there is work being done to say, what are the classes where a module or an element needs to be there? But and for an official response, um, I, I don't think there's any pushback. I don't think there's a refusal to do it. I just think that we it's not happening as fast as many of us would like. And so that takes what we do in our real, in our individual life, when we want a change to occur. We constantly remind ourselves. We constantly affirm that which we desire and know is in our best interest. And so it cannot hurt if everyone who wants more of that is on a consistent basis asking the education department, asking the leadership council, asking the field leader, asking the spiritual leader, wow, how are you integrating this into this event, into this class? Oh, what are we gonna see in the next year where that's gonna show up? Because I, I, I do feel confident saying it's not for lack of desire or awareness. It is simply the process and the prioritization. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and I appreciate that you said pro inclusion, because that falls in line with Ernest's teaching is to to not be against anything, but to be for something. So I would encourage everybody to go back and read sermon by yeah <laughs> right because that is, he does say you know mm -hmm. I show me the person who is not against but you know is for. But it does go on a little further. So he does not tell us not to go for change mm -hmm. in that exact same paragraph, to be committed to it, but not to be arrogant about it and not to be that person who is driven by the ego about it. So I am, I, I believe in anti-racism. Oh, yeah. But the work is not fighting racism. The work is creating something new. Now, in order to create something new, are there times when I have to call racism out? Yes. Does that mean I have to teach people what it looks like when they're taking it for granted? Uh, or, or they're caught up in the cycle and they don't even know they're saying something that's inappropriate or offensive? I'm calling that out because I am serious about the business of transformation from a place where racism is the norm to this new place that I'm going, which is inclusion. And that's a whole different mindset than just fighting racism or being anti-racist. Yeah, you're a metaphysical anti-racist. <laughs> yeah, really. Yeah. Yeah, we should do something with that. that yeah, would be absolutely. A great article, wouldn't it? Yeah. All right. Then we have one. We have one more, and this is kind of a long one. So let me read it to you. Um, how do you respond to people who are concerned that our country and all it represents is going amok, and there seems to be no accountability to those who lead? the way in negative directions, uh, especially in reaching folks who think outside of science of mind framework? Well, I'll, you want me to field that one first? Um, that's what I do every week. That's what I do many times a week is speak to the people who feel the country's running amok and 
some of them feel it's running amok for entirely different reasons than the other people think it's running amok. So you have to, because if everybody were on board with it running amok in one direction, it wouldn't be running amok. You see what I'm saying? It, it would be what it is. It would be where it went, but it wouldn't be, there wouldn't be this conflict in the world. What I have to do is try to assure people it's going to be all right. We're going to make it out alive. This isn't going to kill us. We're not going to have a civil war. We're not going to have blood running in the streets. You know, we're going to have we're going to have peace and we're going to get there. And where I go with that, besides to spirit directly in my in my prayer work to the place where nothing has ever been wrong, nor could it be, is I go back. I clutch at a quote from Terry Cole Whitaker that love brings everything unlike itself up to be healed. And I feel that the generation after generation of metaphysical souls who've done this work long before there was new thought as we recognize it now, but when it was that thin live wire through, through ancient religion and indigenous cultures, all of those people who have intended all of that have brought us to the year 2022, where things are coming apart at the seams. Things are falling apart so they can finally fall together. That's the optimism that I have to keep to keep from collapsing under the weight of what I perceive going on in the world. So that's my thought. What do you think, Tracy? I think the world is running amok. And so if you perceive that, you are correct. The world is running amok because we have reached a point where change is required. And what we do, what we must do, is we must match the intensity of that which is out of alignment with the truth of spirit. We have to match or exceed that intensity with our clarity about what is spiritual living and how was the world created. And it is only not showing up the way that it has been created because of human choice. And we have that free will to, to choose. So what are we going to choose? And when I am, when people tell me, yeah, but how do I do that with people who are not spiritual? You meet their intensity with your intensity. I am not saying meet anger with anger. I'm saying walk the spiritual path with the same level of clarity, assuredness, and not accepting anything less from yourself, from, you, from politicians, from leaders, from people in places you work or visit or shop. But we have, we instead often shrink, shrink, we shrink back. We cannot shrink back because when we shrink back of walking the spiritual truth, we allow for people who don't understand, don't agree, who don't know to become the default. Now where Jesse and I don't quite agree is I think we are headed to a civil war. And I think that there is a very good likelihood that there will be bloodshed because those of us who have the spiritual foundation to bring more love forward have, have in the past and continue now to not live in the world that way. We think it's a little personal philosophy and not a theology and a way to be in the world, to live in the world. And as long as we keep living in these little individual boxes where we think we're safe and we know we're comfortable, then we are ceding the world to people who believe that the only pathway to change and power is violence and separation. So, you know, if we are out there leading and bringing our philosophy into the world, into the reality of everyday human experience, we can shift some things, but mm -hmm. we don't have the leadership that is doing that. We at the in at the local level, the global level, and as long as we are not out there doing that, 
then yeah, we're pretty much saying, well, you know, whoever has the most passion, whoever has the most, the loudest voice, <coughs> they, whoever has the most power, the universe is simply going to say, yes, this is what humankind, or this is what the American public has accepted. Now, where Jesse and I do agree, though, is that the ultimate must be peace. The ultimate must be in our declaration of principles, the end of discord of any kind. And we are assured it is guaranteed it must happen. But between where we are now and experiencing that world where individual and collective discord no longer exists, Today, Tracy believes it is possible that there will be civil war and that we are not prepared for it. And there are gonna be a lot more people killed beside individual black men along the way. And it makes me sad, but sad is not enough. And I'm gonna stop there. <laughs> and sad is not hopeless. Yeah. Well, I'll tell you what, you know, I don't know what's going to come next election cycle. I don't know what's going to come in the next five years, but I'll tell you this. I stand with you. I stand with you. And we will stand together and others will stand with us and we will do what needs doing. And if we have to rebuild this world after it's burned itself to the ground, then that's what we'll do. Yes. Okay. Um, it seems like we're wrapping up here. So uh, there are a whole lot of comments, uh, which we can't even touch on. So I would definitely like everybody to say, hey, go back and read the comments on Facebook. Yeah. But there's one in particular. Um, oh, where did I just lost it? Hang on. It's not that far back. Um, we cannot remain separated from each other and think we are one with God. Yeah, absolutely. And that is, uh, I'm crediting say that. Amen. Yeah. I am crediting that to PJ. Yeah, no, it's well, such a, that's such a basic principle in our teaching. And, uh, and we, if we would just live our teaching we could have such a different experience. And if we would teach more people our teaching, we would have a different experience and we would make it okay for people from many other different faith systems to live their teaching as well. Every time I've wanted to experience God's love, it's shown up through living beings, most of them, people sometimes as lisa knows sometimes animals but most you know most of them people it's not been just this radiant light that fills the room it's it's been the, the warmth of companionship with another being and so i don't know how you can say it's it's all one but i'm keeping people at a distance or i'm keeping some people at a distance because that's cutting off god's love yeah so you know you have to be careful because we're getting ready to start up a whole nother chain of conversation we are so we're going to have to we're going to have to talk here. again about appropriation yes. i want to talk with you about um african spirituality hmm? and how it feeds into uh the truth of our teaching and uh, how that is not the the disconnect there is part of what's going on with our challenges with racism and oh my God, there's just so many things. Have so you read my article about Comet? Yes. In Science My Magazine. Okay, yeah. I, I love, I love Comedic Lore. Uh, I, I love uh, the book Stolen Legacy and all of the other works that, that speak about how the Greeks hijacked the Egyptian culture, the Comedic so culture. We, so yeah, we, we got a lot to have to have about. another yeah. conversation yeah. at some point. Absolutely. Sooner than later, we can make it happen. Believe me. Um, Final thoughts. 
I have totally enjoyed this evening and uh, it's been it's been just awesome to connect with you in this way. Uh, Tracy, thank you again so much for everything that you're doing for all of us who are coming into the light. Mm, I'm just delighted to be here, to be here now, to be here now with you and you and all of you. Um, it is a blessing and a responsibility. Let's make change happen. We are committed. We are committed. We are committed. All right, on that note, I'm gonna wish all of you people on Facebook a wonderful evening. This will go up on YouTube. Uh, I will make sure to share this link as soon as possible. So please share it far and wide. And you heard her, she's committed to coming back. Yeah. Hang on. <laughs>